I can just run faster. <laughs> Blackberry herbicide, new and old. Now, in the interest of time, and how much time I have? 30 minutes, Josh? Yeah, you're 30 to 1. Let me know when I get close to being done. I'm going to go over the new stuff first, and we'll see how far we get into the covering the old ones. But, uh, you know, we're very fortunate in the last couple of years, we've had some uh, new herbicides labeled in blackberries, and there's a few more going to come. And a lot of this has been a result of going through IR4 and, and attending those regional workshops and and putting in requests. I know Josh and I went to school out in California and a uh, weed group from NC State tries to participate in that every year. And we've been very successful in getting some new herbicides labeled in, uh, in blackberry. Uh, you know, we talk about weed control and, and why it's important. Uh, of course, competition is the one that we always think about. And, uh, you know, in newly planted uh, blackberries, uh, weeds can, can significantly reduce growth and it's going to definitely inhibit your ability to have a, a good crop the, your first year of production, which that's what you want to do, try to maximize that return as quick as you can. Um, you know, primocane density, there's been some research that's done over the years that's shown that weeds will reduce primocane density uh, and reduce the diameter of your primocanes and ultimately reduce the tap potential to reduce yields. Uh, physical interference as far as uh, if you've got weeds that are tall like that one slide there shows, uh, you know, they interfere with our applications of fungicides and insecticides basically as a, um, a physical barrier to maybe getting the type of coverage you'd like to have. Um, and also the soil, soil blight issues so for like when we're maybe applying um, directed sprays of, uh, of capture for, uh, for uh, crown weeds. Uh, and worker efficiency is also an issue. Um, you know, harvest is all, of course, done by hand. We've got the issue of trying to move picking stands. We've got issues of, of if you get a lot of crabgrass around those plants in that herbicide strip and during the, the latter part of harvest, uh, we have workers who complain about a, a wet feet because we all know that here in those spring or those summer dews can be real heavy and crabgrass can hang on to a lot of water. And... Um, Unhappy workers uh, make for uh, a longer day. Uh, and they also can interfere with floor cannon movement. So we'll talk about why we need to control weeds. Let's talk about some new options we have. Uh, the first one is Callisto. Callisto is a uh, herbicide that was labeled in originally in, in corn. Um, the use rate on that is three fluid ounces per acre with the option to use two applications. Uh, you have to have at least 14 days between those applications. And, uh, or you can go with six fluid ounces in a single application. Uh, basically, we can't exceed six fluid ounces per acre per year. Uh, we want to use crop oil with that. Uh, the nice thing about Callisto is it has some pre emergence activity, but it also has a lot of post emergence activity. And, uh, but crop oil, 1% volume or volume is recommended, and we can also put some ammonium sulfate with it if we need to. Um, you can apply after the onset of bloom. Um, that's primarily because of residue issues. Uh, the residue work was done, it had to, the applications had to be put out prior to bloom. And again, I mentioned earlier, you can't use more than six fluid ounces per acre per crop year. The nice thing about this that I mentioned earlier is it has pre-emergence and it has post-emergence activity. And the post-emergence activity, I think, is where we can maybe see some real benefit here because we're somewhat limited with, with Paraquat and exactly what it's going to do to certain weeds. But Calisto does a good job on chickweed, as does Paraquat, but henbit, cut leaf eating primrose, curly dock, uh, dandelion, shepherd's purse, swine crest, and white clover, paraquat tends to be fairly weak on all those. And uh, there's a picture of, of uh, those weeds here. There's henbit, um, shepherd's purse, we've got dots, we've got uh, swine crests up there. <coughs> but those weeds that are winter annuals, rosettes, paraquat will tend to burn them off. The growing points down in there, and they tend to regrow real easy. By adding Callisto, you're going to get some additional benefit to those that control post-emergence, especially in that uh, late winter, early spring time period. 
Uh, in terms of pre-emergence control, it does have activity on pigweed, jimson weed, gallon soda, lamb's border, ragweed, smartweed species, and it will suppress morning glories. But again, I think the primary utilization for us here is going to be as a post-emergence herbicide, something we can put with, with parent oil. Um, this is some work we've done in peaches. So let me go ahead and get this out of the way. I'm not saying 2,4-D is labeled in blackberries. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. So don't take that message home. Uh, we use this as a comparison of some work we did in peaches. But it does give you a nice idea of how effective Callisto is post-emergence. We use Callisto in 3 ounces and 6 ounces with 1% volume per volume of crop oil. That's basically 1 gallon per 100 gallon spray solution and 8.5 pounds of ammonium sulfate uh, per 100 gallon of spray solution. Uh, and what we got here was with, with hen bit, which is very difficult to control post-emergence, we got a real good benefit by using Callisto relative to what we got out of 2,4-D at a board per acre. Uh, when we look at cut leaf eating primrose, uh, three ounces was very comparable. Uh, when we got up to six ounces, you know, we got another uh, 10 or so percent control. So uh, that's where Callisto, I think, has a real benefit for us helping out with controlling those emerged winter angles in the late winter and early spring. <laughs> Which is essentially what I'm saying here. Uh, basically, I've, I've made that point, I think, pretty well. Um, as far as how to use it, when and what with, uh, one option would be to put Paraquat and Callisto out in late winter at three to six fluid ounces, depending on what you uh, want to use there. Um, or you could put Callisto and Paraquat together with maybe a Sand bar. Um, if you have horse weed, Callisto is not a great horse weed material. It'll give you some suppression, but it won't give you control. Whereas Sand bar and Paraquat together will control horse weed that's about two to three inches tall. Now, it's not going to control horse weed that's, you know, five, six inches tall, but small horse weed it will control. Another option would be to split that Callisto, the three fluid ounces, into two separate applications. And, uh, you know, the second one has to go out a little bit early, though, in my opinion, because of, of that restriction on the label that says it's got to be put out before bloom is initiated. Uh, so that's just some options that you can think about for if you want to try this, though, to be able to use it. Another one that has uh, got registered is Sandia. Now, Sandia is halosulfuron, and that's been around for some time. If you grew corn, you maybe knew it as permit. Uh, but it's manufactured by Gallon. Uh, Sandia can be used at one half to one ounce per acre. It is primarily a post-emergence herbicide. It also has some pre-emergence activity though, but we consider it primarily a post-emergence product. So therefore, we need to include a non-onyx surfactant at a quarter percent volume per volume. Basically, that's a quarter per hundred gallon. Again, being post and pre-emergence activity, some restrictions. We need 45 days between sequential applications. So you can apply up to uh, two ounces uh, per growing season or per acre per crop year. Um, so depending on what rate you use, that's going to affect the number of applications you can apply. Um, blackberries have to be established at least one year or longer. It has a 14 day pre-harvest interval. And it has a contact, it has a statement on the label where about uh, foliage and uh, basically uh, primocase. Um, you know, that's a, a little bit of a, a concern. We put it out on some young plantings and done a sloppy direct. Uh, we got a little bit of injury, but it never was a significant amount. Um, it's been very minimal. But uh, you need to try to do the best job you can to minimize your contact with your plant. But when you're directing herbicides and you got blackberries growing like they grow, that's practically impossible to basically completely avoid contact. But uh, it's been used in uh, some places uh, prior to being registered, imagine that. And uh, they have, uh, have, have been fairly pleased with it. And like I said, when we have done used it, uh, we got a little bit of injury, but we did get a uh, good recovery and it was very minimal and that was on the, actually on some newly planted uh, plants. It can, only, it can only be used on plants that are established one year or longer. The nice thing about Sandia is it brings to take the table a number of pro, a number of weeds that uh, can be somewhat difficult to control. 
And the ones that I highlighted in red there are the ones that I, I felt was most interesting. Uh, horse metal is one that it will control post emergence. Uh, it also controls maypop passion flower, and I've got a, a spot on one side of uh, one field where we've got a little bit of maypop. Um, the other one it picks up is yellow and purple nut sage. Now, depending on where you're at, most of us in the Piedmont and mountains would have yellow. If you get in the coastal plain or even our friends down in Georgia and South Carolina, there's a good possibility they could have purple or mixed stands of yellow and purple. Of course, people always say, well, how do you tell the difference? And the, at the picture on the bottom here, you can see yellow nut sage tends to have a very sharp pointed leaf tip, whereas purple tends to be a little more blunt. The leaf tip on purple nut sage tends to be a lot like that of, uh, of uh, bluegrass shape. A, a boat shaped tip, what it was always referred to when we were uh, learning identification of bluegrass. But that's the best way to tell them apart without digging up and looking at tubers. Uh, purple tends to not grow quite as tall. Subjectively, it tends to be a little darker green in nature, and uh, it's more difficult to control. But Sandia does an excellent job of controlling both of those. Um, and uh, I'm going to slide, I'll talk more about that in a minute. And it also controls a uh, poke weed, uh, which uh, you know can be a problem spotty here and there, um, and it's a perennial, uh, but it does control it post emergence. You know, it is a. I mentioned nut sedge being a strong suit for sandia. This is some more work that we done in peaches. Um, this is a chateau was used the winter or the spring before. This is one year later, and this is where we use chateau with uh, Sandia followed by another Sandia application. And you can see that uh, one year after, there's quite a bit of difference in the amount of nut sage in there. This was a real heavy infestation of nut sage. And the nice thing about Sandia is it'll give you nut sage control in season, but it's gonna reduce tuber viability, and you're gonna be able to tell the following year that you had a, you had used Sandia there. When I was in graduate school, uh, it was a number compound from Monsanto. And I remember being at the research station up in Lewiston, North Carolina, which is up in the northeast corner. And uh, they had used uh, that number compound in the in field work, corn work there the year before. And the following year, you could identify the plots of where it was at. It had a checkerboard effect. You had the perfect squares with and without nut sage because it was so good on reducing tumor viability. Salida is another one that's a herbicide that contains active ingredient remsulfuron. <coughs> now, Matrix has a uh, supplemental label, which is the same chemical. It's, it's just uh, mon, uh, excuse me, DuPont's version. Salida is, uh, I believe, Kim Churros. Uh, Matrix has a label for use in blackberries only in certain states. The Salida label has the use for all states and is registered in North Carolina, I know for sure. And it should be in South Carolina as well. That, that label is, a, is on their main label. So it's a, it's a national label. Um, the use rate is four ounces per acre. Uh, it has pre and post emergence activity as well. Uh, so if you want to get some post emergence activity, you put a non ionic surfactant with it, quarter percent volume per volume. Um, now here's the interesting statement, and this is one that, that's real consistent with the label they have on tree fruit. When applied as a banding treatment, and you're treating 50% of the or 50 of the treated band or less, in other words, is the herbicide band you're putting out, is it 50% or less of your row spacing? So if you've got blackberries on a 15 foot row spacing, as long as you're treating seven and a half foot or less of a herbicide strip, you can make two applications of Sandia at four ounces. That's basically what the label said. Allow 30 days between applications. It can be used on blackberries established one year or longer. It has a 21 day pre-harvest interval. Uh, it mentions to use the directed application adjusted to provide complete coverage of weeds while minimizing the amount of spray coming into contact with the caneberry plants. Now the fellow that wrote this label knows something about caneberries. Because he, he said minimize, and he understands you're going to have to direct it. And uh, 
So this is uh, uh, the restrictions on that product. Now this is some work that we've done again. We've looked at saliva a lot in uh, rim sulfur on a lot in, in tree fruits. It's had a label for a number of years. And this is some weed control work that we've done um, in, in tree fruit. Um, this is saliva, four ounces, followed by paraquat, the first bar. The second bar is saliva, four ounces, with two quarts of surfing applied twice. We have put the application out on March the 29th and come back again on June 13th. This is Simazine on March the 29th, followed by a paraquat application. Uh, Simazine, excuse me, and, and surfing or rise on tank mix. And uh, is the third bar. This is Palmer Amaranth, which of course is a pigweed species. This is tall water glory, and this is percent bare ground. You can see where we use two applications of uh, saliva, four ounces, with two quarts of surfing each time. Uh, it did an excellent job on pigweed, did pretty good on our tall water glory, and on percent bare ground here in August, uh, we're still at, you know, close to 90% bare ground. Does a very good job, that purple does. Comparing that back to the Simazine or the Salina alone followed by Paraquat, you can see you've got a little weaker performance in terms of length of residuals. In other words, uh, the other products, if I showed you the whole results from this trial, the other products did give us some pre-emergence control of those weeds, but they ran out of gas before the, the sequential application, which makes perfectly good sense. Um, so I just wanted to show that with you. Here's another program where we did uh, saliva tank mix with uh, surfing and sandbar. The first uh, bar here is saliva and surfing. This is saliva actually at two ounces with uh, two pounds of sandbar, which uh, this was in tree fruit, so that will probably in our area about a pound of sandbar is what most of us are going to use. If you're on the sandier soil, you're going to have to lighten up a little bit probably from that. Um, Simazine and surfing tank mix here. And you can see on the Palmer Amaranth annual grasses, uh, this is common first lane and percent bare ground. Um, the salida programs with the rhizome or two ounces of salida with the sim bar did a very good job for us. Uh, actually, this is a photograph of uh, the sim bar and um, salida tank mix uh, that was taken here. And these observations were made 128 days after application. So that's about four months. Uh, where does it fit? Uh, it's not a standalone pre emergence product. Uh, I don't want to mislead you and think that it is. It needs to be really tank mixed with either surfing or, for that matter, um, uh, sun bar might be a good choice to put with it. Um, Couple of programs here, you know, late February with saliva and horizon and two quarts. Uh, the nice thing about that is it will also control horse weed if you get it when it's in that two to three inch tall stage, um, if that's an issue for you. And then come back before primocane emergence with saliva and horizon at uh, two quarts of horizon and another four ounces of, of saliva. Uh, that's assuming you're going to you're treating less than 50% of the, the uh, area underneath the vines, underneath the the canes in your herbicide strip. Um, option two might be to go with Callisto and Sim or Simbar early and then come back with uh, Salida or, or put up that horizon rate to four quarts. Um, that tends to help out on late season crabgrass control a lot if we do that and run the four quart weight at the rate of uh, horizon or surfing. And another option would be to uh, go with the Salida Simbar tank mix uh, before primocane emerges. Um, that would be another option. Any questions on that? Uh, another label that's come through, and this is a North Carolina only label. And the reason for that is it was linked together with some vegetable uses, and we were lucky enough to piggyback cane berries onto that label. Uh, but Dual Magnum does have a label for uh, blackberries. It's a 24C label, and it requires an indemnification agreement. And what that means is you have to go to uh, Syngenta's website, pharmacist.com, you have to register, and then you have to agree not to uh, hold them responsible if you get any damage. And this is a fairly common thing that Syngenta has done quite a bit with specialty crop labels. Uh, they call it a third-party indemnification agreement. 
uh, it's not that uncommon in, in vegetables for, for them to do this. A lot of times, vegetable growers associations or grower groups hold those labels, but in this case, they're going to let you go to the website register and agree to it. Um, use rates are one to two pints per acre. It can be used on new plantings and coarse textured soils. It's so long as you stay at that one pint uh, rate. It has a 28-day pre-harvest interval in varying situations. You cannot see one application, more than one application per year. This is a pre-emergence herbicide. <coughs> has no post-emergence activity. It does mention on the label they've done limited cultivar testing. I just wanted to, to include that information to you. Primarily a pre-emergence grass material and small seeded uh, probably wheat. But you know, yellow, yellow nut seed is one that, that dual might will give you some limited control of. Um, you know, it's not gonna give you 90 plus percent control like Sandia, but it's gonna give you 70 to 80 percent control. A pretty good material uh, compared to, to some of the other products that don't have any activity at all. Um, how much time got, Josh? About 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Uh, in the, uh, if most of you come in, you should have got one of these. If you didn't, there's some of those in the back of the room. <coughs> in the back of this publication, there is the 2014 Cambridge IPM guide. And in that guide, it has our herbicide recommendations. Uh, so, just wanted to, to share that with you while we was at this point. Uh, but solar cam has a, a, a label. Um, it's a dormant application, really. Um, it tends to be weak on pigweed. The use rate is two and a half to five pounds. It will suppress nut sage. Um, the only thing is with, with solar cam, I have seen some damage on our heavier soil like this from a dormant application. You get some whitening in those veins. And that's uh, something that didn't appear to cause any problem, didn't really appear to affect yield, but it's not the kind of thing growers like to see. Uh, so just be aware that if you use that, that is a concern. The lighter the soil, the more likely you are to have that to happen. A serpent or a rising, two to four quarts per acre, you need activation, a rainfall to activate that within 14 to 21 days. The last few years on our farm, I have looked at and been using at least three or four quarts of surfing. Uh, I tend to go in early with a paraquat sandbar application, a low rated sandbar, about a half pound, and then about the time I see primocanes beginning to <coughs> pop through, I go back through with two quarts of, of simazine and four quarts of surfing is what I've been doing. The nice thing about the full quart rate of surfing is if you get in a, a summer like we were in this past year where we get a lot of rain and crabgrass can become an issue, you get a little better, longer residual crabgrass control with four quarts than you're going to get with two quarts. And the reason that's a concern is if you look at your graminicides, your post and your clethodems, the pre-harvest interval on those are 45 days and 7 days respectively. Now, if we're picking blackberries when our pre-emergence herbicide breaks down in the 1st of July, ain't it going to wait seven days before you go back in there and pick? Those pre-harvest intervals on those graminicides are too long. So what I like to do is uh, load up on the surface with a higher rate so that so make sure we get enough residual to try to get us through the bulk of that harvest season. Simazine, of course, has a label of two to four quarts. If you use the dry formulation, it's 2.2 to 4.4 pounds per acre. Uh, Casseron has a label. You know, Casseron was used a lot years ago. It's a granular material, Casseron 4G. They also have a liquid Casseron CS. Uh, we've looked at it. I sprayed some out in candy berries. Um, the CS liquid formulation is supposed to be a little more stable, and you should be able to put it out when it's a little warmer because Casseron tends to volatilize in warm temperatures. Ideally, you need to put it out when temperature is not going to get really above 50 degrees. And all of the old timers used to say the best time to put it out would be right before snow because it snows on it, melts, and takes it in the ground, and it'll, and it'll work really good. Um, but Casseron 4G is very broad spectrum. It does a good job if you put it out. Uh, at the right time, you get the right kind of conditions. 
But because it's granular, you know, it's something that most people don't want to, to mess with. Sin um, <clears throat> bar, one to two pounds. Uh, plantings have to be established at least one year. Um, it mentions about flying in the spring. You've got to put it out prior to the fruit set. Um, it mentions also 70 day pre harvest interval. So you have to be careful there, uh, especially on our early varieties. Um, the nice thing about uh, the nice thing about sin bar is it does give you some post-emergence activity, gives you a lot of residual. Uh, it's a very good broad-spectrum pre-emergence herbicide. Uh, this is an example of where we got post-emergence horse weed control. Here we used the uh, sin bar. Here we did not. We added it to the parable. These rows are side by side. Uh, you know, the thing about spin bar, especially if some of you in here I know are from the coastal plains, the sand hills, uh, on those soils, I would, especially in the sand hills, I would stay away from it. On the coastal plain, I'd be very careful. Uh, you can get some damage uh, like this. Um, I see this damage, you have seen it, when we've used it at a, a pound and a half, especially on the end of the road where the tractor slows down and where you do a lot of turning. Uh, you get some overdose there, but that's the kind of damage you can get from sin bar. <coughs> Vermont SL has a label. Of course, there's other generic formulations of paraquat. You know, the other thing that amazes me is glyphosate has a label. Uh, it says do not allow contact with green bark uh, foliage or green canes. Applies and direct to shield his spray. Now look at this statement I put on here. The safest place for glyphosate around the blackberry is in the jug. <laughs> John Clark shaking his head. He knows what I'm talking about. My recommendation to kill blackberries, to kill blackberries in tree fruits is apply a one to one and a half percent solution anytime from bloom all the way through November. So if you want to get out of the blackberry business, <laughs> glyphosate is a good option for you. So just, even though it's labeled, uh, don't go out and necessarily buy it. Um, AIM has a label. AIM is purely a selected post-emergence herbicide. It's real good on morning glories. Um, it's good on very small pigweed. Um, thing about AIM is, other than morning glories, the size of weeds have to be really small, the ones that are susceptible. I mentioned post, fusillate, and select. Fusillate is a non bearing use only, so you only use that in unit plant situation. <coughs> post has a 45 day PHI, select max has a 7 day PHI. Now, if we want to control Bermuda grass, we want to put that initial application out when we have 4 to 6 inches of new growth with crop oil in the spring. We're going to need to make a second application sometime after that, depending on our weather, whenever we get regrowth occur. Uh, has anybody got an idea of when four to six inches of new growth in the spring is roughly going to be in western North Carolina? Probably going to be somewhere around the last of April, the first week or so of May. Now, to put on that first application, we need to make a second one. Let's say that's four weeks later. That's the first or second week of June, last to May. 45 day pre harvest interval. Technically, you can't make that second application and be legal. Select max, we did get a reduction in our PHI to seven days through our form. Because of that, if you got Bermuda grass problems, and in order to be legal with your pre harvest intervals, the cleft of them are select max. Select max is the only one that has a bearing label. Select max is going to be the product you're going to need to probably use. I mentioned fall trees. How much time have I got, Josh? Three minutes. Three minutes. Uh, I'm good at time. <laughs> control the uh, winter annual weeds. I like a fall tree because it does control winter annual weeds. That can be difficult to control in the spring. That's something you need to, if you're not doing I'd encourage you to do it. The big thing is you don't want to go out too early with that. You don't want to go with your pre-emergence in August or September because it will tend to run out of gas before you get to March. 
You need to time that and push it back to about Thanksgiving, Halloween. Sometime in between Halloween and Thanksgiving is a good time to do that. Uh, this is just wild lettuce control with, with fall herbicides or prickly lettuce. Um, I have some problems with that. I don't know if any of you do, but it can get real tall. It has prickles on it. And it has these little plink pink, plink, you don't talk about it, y'all. Plums, that's a great term, y'all. He's a weed scientist, so I feel. Um, but uh, plums, uh, seeds, they can be real aggravating for the pickers. They can be real aggravating. And I've even found them a time or two or seen them in the uh, clam shells just from them picking you if you've got those. But, um, you know, Chateau is one we were looking at. It's going to get a label soon. Uh, Simazine at two quarts there. And the uh, Simbar at one and a half pound. And uh, Solar Cam at two and a half pound did a, a good job on that. But Chateau's not got a label yet. That's one we're expecting to get a label for, though. Probably next year at this meet, hopefully we'll be able to tell you we've got a Chateau label to use in, uh, in Caneberry. And that is all I have. Uh, I'll take any questions you've got and try to answer them. If not, we'll uh, try to find out an answer for you and get back to it. Yes, sir. I've got a question about the surflag control on uh, winter weeds. Okay. Uh, is that does that do a good job on uh, your winter on your winter weeds applied in the fall or, or not? <laughs> We've done some work with surflag applied in the fall. And it's okay, but I, there's better options for you. Uh, I think Simazine is a better choice uh, for pre emergence control. Uh, Simbar would definitely be a better choice. Uh, so, you know, I, I, the other thing is, if you look at what's going to run out of run out of gas first, the circle is probably going to run out of gas before the other two products, and that's been what we typically saw. Uh, John, you have a question? I have deep trouble with Virginia pepper weed, and I noticed Callisto uh, got after uh, Shepherd's first, and that did it be a winter map problem, but it's taller than Shepherd's first. Yeah, the, the Virginia pepper weed, I haven't noticed it in any of our blackberry plains. Josh, have you seen any Virginia pepper weed? Now, when we get, uh, when I get a little further south of here in some peach orchards, I've seen it down on the ridge in South Carolina in some orchards down there. You don't know it's Callisto. I don't know if the list will control it. It's, it's got a, a pretty good possibility it will, but I think Matrix, or uh, excuse me, Rim Sulfuron will pick it up. Um, I think it would, I'm, I'm pretty sure we've had some trial work in it, and, and the Rim Sulfuron picked up some pepper weed. The uh, uh, saliva. Can I ask another question? Yeah. What if you spray post early on some good grass, and then you went with Select Max as your second? Would that work? We had never done that, and I, but I, my guess is it probably would, don't you think, Josh? I, I don't see why it would have a, an issue because, um, you know, you typically, uh, you're, you're trying to, that initial application knocks it back, and you're going to get a little regrowth. I don't see why you didn't do that. Um, if you uh, did and it didn't work, you can call Dr. John Clark, University of Arkansas. <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, that, but, you know, I don't, I don't really see why it wouldn't be a, a possibility for to do that, especially if you were in a bind. How good is the rim sulfur on the morning glory? On the peaty morning glory, it's not as good. We had good luck on the tall, but when you get in the peaty, you know, it's not as good. Just it's somewhat species specific there. Any other questions? Well, if you thank any, I'll be around the rest of the day, and I appreciate you having me. All right, um, uh, here lunch is ready, but before lunch, Norman Sykes wanted to stand up and say a few words to the Deployment Security Commission. We don't have anybody specifically talking about 